It looks like a classic environmental fight shaping up in Tennessee. Whitewater rafters battling the giant Tennessee Valley Authority's plans to divert the Okoe River. Okoe River Council Director David Brown. The Okoe uh, is a more value as a recreation resource in the summer than a 19 megawatt source of hydropower. The fact that uh, TVA and, and the environmental impact statement admits that net annual benefits won't be noticeable in power rates would indicate to me that some small measure of use of the river for recreation would be even less noticeable. Hi everybody, I'm Mark Hunt. In this episode, we'll be interviewing David Brown, well known in the Whitewater community as the person who saved the Okoe River. That was through his work leading a successful grassroots preservation effort in the early 1980s. We'll be hearing some of David's stories about the earliest days of paddling on the river and about that 1980s battle for the future of recreation on the river. After we recorded this interview last fall, David went on to publish his fine book, Whitewater Wars, that covers the Okoe story, along with an equally interesting one about his experiences later in the 1980s, leading a similar successful effort to protect whitewater recreation on West Virginia's famous Gauley River. If you enjoy this interview, you'll love his book. David has a knack for getting himself into the middle of some good stories and he's even better at telling them. Whitewater Wars is sold on Amazon in both electronic and paperback editions. The fight at Okoe was all about the future operations of the Okoe No. 2 hydropower project. And I think you'll understand David's story better if I provide this quick primer on how the Okoe No. 2 system works. Okoe No. 2 is not a typical hydropower system that relies on a tall dam and a reservoir. Okoe No. 2 is a diversion project. Here's how it works. At this 30-foot tall dam, which is the location now of the put-in, nearly the entire flow of the river is diverted out of the natural river channel and into a wooden flume. The flume extends about 4.7 miles, paralleling the river the entire way. Now, the flume drops only about 10 feet over that distance, and in the meantime, the riverbed drops about 260 feet. So at the end of the flume, water is sent straight down the hillside through these huge pipes called penstocks and into the power plant. The enormous water pressure in the penstocks spin two big turbines, which in turn drive two large generators. The electricity produced from those generators is then sent out over the TVA system via high voltage power lines. The Okoe No. 2 project was first built in 1911 to 1913 by the East Tennessee Power Company. In 1949, a huge federal agency called the Tennessee Valley Authority acquired Okoe No. 2. From 1913 until Labor Day weekend in 1976, the flume carried the river's flow 24-7 and year-round. During that time, the riverbed remained largely dry except for during very rare flood events. Of course, there was essentially no whitewater recreation during that time. But on that 1976 weekend, TVA shut down the flume for extensive repairs. And voila! Water was back in the river on a daily basis for the first time in decades. Immediately with these restored flows, kayakers, canoers, and rafting companies flocked to the Okoe because its powerful Class III rapids proved to be some of the region's very best whitewater. My interview with David turned out to be a bit more of a conversation than an interview, and that's because I have a role in this story as well. I happen to be one of those kayakers who found my way to the Okoe, actually on that very first weekend of restored flows, and within a few months had, along with a partner, started the first rafting company on the river. 
I and many others worked actively in support of David's efforts in the following years in the battle for the Okoe. As I said, David is a great teller of this story, so let's go straight to that conversation. Labor Day weekend of 1976, uh, Roger Scott and Bill Chipley and I had paddled it, and we were hearing rumors about what had happened with the flume line and the power plant. Talk about what really happened, what TVA's decisions were, and what happened then. Well, the flume line uh, was shut down that weekend, and water returned to the riverbed really 365 days a year, as long as they were generating from upstream. And that's uh, when paddlers really started flocking to the river. Of course, you started your rafting company, and uh, in 77, there were about 7,000 rafters on the river, and plus some pri private boats. Yeah, and it, was, it, it really spurred some interest among kayakers. And right. People would drive here from Everywhere. Pennsylvania yeah. and, and Ohio and a long way to come paddle. And TVA started uh, evaluating reconstruction of the flume line and the power project. But the first thing they did was to get it, the project registered on the National Register of Historic Places, which ensured that it would be built to, rebuilt to 1913 specifications using yellow pine and the original construction uh, specifications. And if you're interested in the most efficient way to generate electricity, that might not have been the best idea. <laughs> No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> so uh, they had to do an environmental impact statement and they did scoping. There were a lot of uh, paddlers having input. Quite, that was most of the input, frankly, were paddlers concerned about the future of the river. Uh, and then they published their final e uh, EIS in 78 where they proposed a number of scenarios, one of which was 84 days of water releases. And so everybody kind of felt like there was going to be some paddling after the project was uh, finished. But then when the board met to reauthorize the project uh, in an official decision, they dropped the bomb that any paddling would be require strict reimbursement for the power that's lost when water was returned to the riverbed. So if they're running water down the riverbed, it's not going through the flume line and then not going through the turbines at the power project. Well, in my memory of, of how that went down was the initial indication from TVA is, was, hey, you guys don't have anything to worry about. There'll be water in the river. We were all happy and we were going along and then the bomb dropped that you referenced and we all got nervous. And we actually, the, the TVA told us some dollar amount that we would have to pay, which was exorbitant. Yeah. And, and we, uh, we had actually approached Congress about appropriating the money instead. I mean, TVA said, well, if you can get, if you can get Congress to give us the money, then... Yeah, it was $5 million. I think you actually made a statement at a congressional hearing at one point. Yeah. And, uh, but it obviously did not have support from even the congressional delegation in Chattanooga because it never made it out of committee. Right. And so we were, we were faced with the uh, prospect of losing the river altogether uh, and you know nobody really understood at the time what was going on and there was no campaign to, uh, in place to save the river. Outfitters were obviously uh, somewhat organized but still not uh, not really organized with an effort to uh, directed to save the river. And meanwhile uh, the river was becoming more popular. Through 1978 there were uh, you know, the, the use like quadruple, there were eight outfitters operating in 78. And yeah, I think it was, was 15,000 people on the river in 78. By, by 1980, it was over 52, over 50,000. And on the, on the kayaking front, what was interesting to me, this was the dawn of the plastic boat era as well, meaning kayaks and canoes were more durable than the earlier versions before the Okoe. And so you could go out and, and, and run over the rocks or run into rocks. You could, you, you'd have a boat that would last you years, you wouldn't have to repair it. And that made kayaking more accessible. Um, the nature of the rapids on the Okoe, bigger waves, deeper channels, really much more fun kayaking than most other rivers we were accustomed to in the South. Uh, and, and, and the constant availability 
with water in the riverbed, dam controlled from upstream, added to the popularity as well. So, uh, you know, a, a class two, three paddler that might live two or three hours away could come here just about every weekend and skills would build very dramatically. So it, that, that really added to the popularity of, in the paddling community, I think, and it's it's what brought you here. Actually. Oh yeah, talk if about you, your if you learn if you learn to paddle the Ocoa, you could paddle the Grand Canyon through the you know the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And you were one of those kayakers that kind of fell in love with the Ocoa from a distance. You were living down south of Atlanta, I think. Yeah, I was in uh, I I'd lived in Augusta, Georgia, and moved to uh, Washington State and came back in 1980 and started paddling again. And that's when I discovered that. The flume line construction was about to begin, right? And no, but nobody seemed to know what was really going on, and uh, that's when I approached Bill Miller. But the thing about paddling is, in a way, that was the era of the birth of play boating, right? And so, with, especially with the plastic boats, and so you would spend hours and hours on the Okoe just in play spots, you know, doing enders and pop ups and pirouettes. And somebody would park and park and play I mean we that's how the term got got its name I think park on the side of the road and hop, go down to the slice and dice or double trouble or hell hole right, yeah but Bill Bill you, so you and I bumped into the, each other on the river one day yeah Bill Miller had told me that uh, he was a president of uh, Tennessee Valley Canoe Club he told me that uh, I should uh, meet you and so we met at double trouble and I kind of gave you my little spiel about Getting a, organizing a broader effort, and you were a little bit uh, skeptical, I think, <laughs> at the time. And well, then, was, you know, I was among the outfitters. I had done some work organizing it. Yeah, it's kind of like herding cats. You know, outfitters, a friend described, are like marbles that bounce off each other continually. Right, yeah. And so, you know, we weren't really the most natural group to organize and do something, but. David, I remember you, uh, after we met and had our first conversation, you weren't willing to give up. You're, you're a tenacious fighter. You're, you're not afraid. You showed up at my house. I was there cooking a meal for 20 raft guides. They were going to show up like an hour later. You walked in my door. And I remember clearly you said, Mark, the, the Okoe is going to die unless we get really serious and do something. What, what are we going to do? And you, you, it was a, you challenged me a little bit, and I, I felt myself getting a little on board, and and, and we had a great hour-long brainstorm that evening, and it led to other things. So uh, take well, it from there. Well, we did that van tour uh, of, of the, with, with some private boaters, Bill Miller, you, Dick Eustace, talking to people who had tangled with TVA. I remember meeting with Frank Fly. At the time, you know, a lot of people were still kind of questioning whether we could deal directly with TVA, direct negotiation, or we were going to have to take a different course. And so uh, Frank Fly made it clear to us that we couldn't trust TVA. Now Frank was is an attorney. Was an attorney. Yeah, and he was he was fighting the Columbia Dam on the Duck River. Yeah, he was up near Nashville, and we, right. we stopped and saw him. And we were on we were in Bill Miller's van on the way back. And Dick Eustace, who you mentioned, was the manager of the Okoe Outpost for Danahale Outdoor Center. And uh, I think you sensed that it was going to take a lot of work and. People might not cooperate, and you know, was really worth it. You said something to the effect, "Well, guys, I, I, I tell you what, this, you know, I may have to go back out to Washington State and be a ski lift operator again." <laughs> and we stopped at a Cracker Barrel for a pee break, and Dick Eustace and I kind of huddled, and, and I said, "Hey, hey, Dick, if we offer, if we offer David 150 bucks a week, and if NOC will pay half, Sunburst will pay half, maybe he'll." stick around and help us a little longer and it's when we got back in the van you know I pitched that idea and you said yeah let's do it you you couldn't you couldn't wait yeah, it was all you right. needed it took you about one second to decide that uh we, we, you know this was gonna be your thing for a while and you moved into guide housing you got free housing out of this yeah it was right called. yeah I lived in your uh guide house uh that first winter and uh you folks had gone to Colorado Crested Butte. Um, so we were, you know, and I was, we really were very green. You know, we knew we had to do something, not exactly sure what. Uh, we had gotten a little council from American Rivers and set up the Okoe River Council, which was private boaters and 
an outfitter. So we had an organization and I was getting the administrative stuff together. Um, there had been a petition put up at uh, Laddie's Golf Station and got about 200 names on it, op opposing recreation on the river. Like, and, kind of like forever. Like yeah, shut yeah down just shut down recreation. Generate electricity purely. Yeah, totally back opposed. To the, back to the yeah. way it was. Yeah, totally ban <laughs> kayaking and, and rafting. Uh, and But that disappeared, and so we kind of thought, well, maybe, you know, it's nothing's happening with it. But then I got a call from Tish Jenkins, a Southeastern District Administrator from TVA, and said that this petition had been received by Congress with over 2,000 names on it against recreation on the river. And, of course, my heart sunk because that was a political catastrophe. But she told me to come look at it. So I drove over to her office. She gave me a copy of it. And right away, I found Jake Kerr's name on it. Jake rented your headquarters to you. And I knew Jake would not have signed the thing. So, you know, my uh, suspicions were raised by that. I took the petition to Jake. Jake looked at it and said, David, there are dead people on this petition. <laughs> and so Jake got mad, immediately jumped in his car and went to the Cleveland newspaper. And so it blew up in the newspaper, and TVA started a, quote, investigation. Right. Uh, after which they determined their employees were not involved and implied that we set them up, which was a total lie, because just Jenkins had already told me that t they knew their employees were involved in it. So what, 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 what this uh, is sort of illustrating, at the corporate, you know, top levels of TVA, they were facing a precedent. They didn't want to release water, give away water that could generate electricity because it would set a precedent and they didn't want to do that. That's why they were pressing for reimbursement to do it. And at the local level, TV employees were feeling uh, that their jobs were threatened. Even though we weren't really after shutting down this project, we just wanted a balance of power generation and releases for recreation. Uh, but it's interesting to that, that, that there, there was a lot of local opposition beyond the TVA employees, and it was, it, it had a little bit to do with the culture. You know, Polk County is a remote uh, Appalachian uh, uh, region that is predominated by national forests, and uh, a lot of traditional way of life in those days here. And this influx of rafting companies and whitewater paddlers and hippies and you know, it was very threatening to some people, and it, 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 you know, it, it, they didn't want their lives disrupted. So it was kind of bumpy in terms of local relationships in those days. Yeah, I think uh, Outfitters had some good relationships with local people through their business dealings. Yeah. And so, uh, but TBA, uh, the Office of Power was dead set, set against recreation on the river, and of course, the local employees were as well. So uh, that, guaranteed that there was going to be a fight for the river. So at one point we tried a lawsuit. Yeah, so after TVA had kind of implied that we were behind the petition in the newspaper, it really made me mad. And JT had, uh, JT Lemons, who ran Okoye Outdoors, had uh, been introduced to an attorney in Nashville, Charlie Warfield, who asked, told him if we ever need any help give him a call and so I thought we should explore the potential for uh, a lawsuit and early on in the battle I'd looked at the Teleco Dam controversy and had determined there were basically four options to win. There was no action where you could just accept whatever they gave you. There was direct negotiation and you can't win direct negotiation from a position of weakness which is where we were. There was potential legal action, and then there was political action. Well, it's pretty apparent from the Teleco Dam situation that while you might be able to do, delay the project in some way or enhance your negotiating position, political action was ultimately going to be the way the river was saved. But we decided to, to file a lawsuit in hopes of forestalling the project and maybe bringing TVA to the negotiating table. Uh, we actually won the first round because TVA, when they had done the EIS, and so just just to back up, a federal a lawsuit in federal court, in federal court, court, U.S. District Court, in Chattanooga, filed under the 
uh, claiming under the National Environmental Policy Act a law that requires that a proper environmental impact statement be filed. We sued on the grounds that the EIS was defective, that they were not as full and complete in considering options in a fair way in the EIS, particularly. That's right. And we won on the first round because right. TVA had not mentioned the requirement for reimbursement for lost power in the environmental impact statement. And so the judge, Frank Wilson, required TVA to reconsider, and uh, but he didn't stop the project. So that uh, pretty much meant that uh, our negotiating position was probably not going to be enhanced by the lawsuit. Right. The one thing it did do is it really elevated our stature uh, because it, Prior to that, we were really just a ragtag group of uh, paddlers in river sandals and river shorts. Well, some, and, some would claim that we're still a ragtag yeah. group. <laughs> and TBA certainly didn't really take us seriously. Right. And until we filed a lawsuit. And we got tremendous media coverage. And the interesting thing was, evolved is that a lot of the reporters who had covered the Teleco Dam issue and had become uh, disaffected with TVA by their strong arm tactics there started covering the Ocoee battle and giving us favorable publicity. And, and But we knew then that the only action we were going to take was political. And so some of our first public relations and political efforts, talk about those. Well, we had some backing at the state level and even at the federal level. Uh, Governor Alexander, uh, who is now Senator Alexander, had run the river, done a commercial for Tennessee Department of Tourism with Jerry Reed around 79. That played all over the southeast, opened the floodgates for the river. Uh, and it was obvious they were having a great time. So, the, you know, we sensed we had some support at the state level, uh, but um, you know you had to figure out you had to convert that into action, and there had to be a, a plan and a strategy. So uh, the original proposal from TVA was to get money from Congress, uh, and that had been rebuffed. So we had to to build political support. And I drove around in my car to every chamber of commerce county commission, tourism board, with getting resolutions passed in, in favor of the river. And we got it every time. I, we, there was not one time we were denied. Everybody supported it. So the Okoye had a lot of political support, and that's the way we built it. And uh, there was a lot of uh, engagement by outfitters, or I, I should say engagement of the customers and guests of outfitters, big letter writing campaigns. Most outfitters actually had tables set up with pens and papers and envelopes, and the outfitters paid the postage, so we would beg our guests as the trip finished to write a quick letter to TVA, and they would do it in their own words, and we would we'd say, here, we'll seal the envelope and put the stamp on it, and that was... Yeah, I would go around at the end of the weekend and pick up the letters and mail them. Usually we'd have 200 or so. Yeah. But over time, that helped. In fact, I got a call one day from TVA guy saying, why is Claiborne Pell from Rhode Island calling us about the Ocoee? Senator Pell. Yeah, Senator Pell. U.S. Senator Pell. So we, it had broad reach. And, you know, that was the critical thing that uh, I recognized early on is, you know, at the time, private boating was fairly weak politically, and there was no way that just private boaters alone were going to be able to save the river. It needed, it required a coalition, and the outfitters brought rafting customers and had the funding uh, that was necessary to at least put up a good fight. And to be clear, your roots were as a private boater. I mean, you love yeah. kayaking, and you still love it. Right. Matter of fact, here, you're in your early 70s, I'm in my early 60s. We're, we're going to maybe get on the river here in just a while, but, you know, I... Uh, I start my partner Bill and I started our company as kayakers, but I think you're right about the the influence, on the, the economic benefits of of the outfitting industry on tourism, uh, and the organizing capacity of outfitters was really important 
um, well, it was essential to the win because we, um, you know, I, the, both the political constituency, constituency and we were fighting uh, the mantra that hydropower and power is always better than recreation. And so we had to get, uh, have significant economic impacts at that time to compete successfully. So we've got these petitions going. We've got a lot of grassroots support building in the community. We're getting a lot of press, a lot of endorsements, as you said. Uh, but we had some local events. Yeah, we raised money uh, and helped uh, con coalesce support by having river festivals. We had two Okoe River Festivals, both of which were great successes. Uh, 1982 and 83, I think. Uh, 81 and 82. 81 and 82. 81 and 82. And so those were great. But then our uh, the Sixth Circuit decided against us on our lawsuit, and we were back almost to point zero in terms of a solution. Um, now, one JT and I had been running around the state capitol one day, and he said, let's go over and see Tom Ingram, who we knew from the river trip. He was uh, Governor Alexander's chief of staff. And so I said, okay. Let's Governor Lamar Alexander, now U.S. Senator yeah, Lamar correct. Alexander. He was governor at the time. And he was a very popular governor yeah. and very effective. Right. And so Ingram came out, and he said, hey, guys, let me tell you something. You've got to get directly to the governor on this issue. So we had been meeting, obviously, with everybody else, and uh, there was just a, there were a lot of platitudes, but no real action being taken. And the governor at that point had been rafting maybe three times. I I think it I, once or twice. Once or twice. Or twice that, yeah, that I know about. Uh, uh, so it was actually we were it was kind of a dark winter in '83 because the river was flume line was nearing completion. And we didn't have any clear path for victory. And then let me, let me put an exclamation point on that. On Labor Day weekend, the Saturday of Labor Day weekend, 1983, the flume was completed. They diverted water into the flume once again. The riverbed went dry. The outfitters were literally out of business on that Saturday. Exactly seven years to the day after TVA uh, began putting the water back in the river uh, to, to repair the flume. And so we, we were desperate. Everybody was desperate. Well, what had happened is back that winter of 83, I got a call from a guy out west, Jerry Mallett, who told me that Alexander was going to be doing a river trip from Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Governor Alexander, the yeah. same, yeah. And uh, so he and said, uh, you know, I'll hold a spot for you on the trip. He was organizing the trip. It wasn't a political trip. It was really a fundraiser and a vacation trip uh, for the governor and his family. And so I jumped at it, of course, and it cost me 600 bucks, drove out and um, got on the river. The governor was not on the first half of the uh, trip. He came in on the second half, and I was walking uh, down Bright, the uh, Bright Angel Trail toward uh, Phantom Ranch when I met him and uh, I introduced myself and I saw his jaw drop <laughs> to meet somebody from Tennessee you know in the depths of the Grand Canyon and so he's and of course he'd been getting a few letters about the Okoe. Yeah he'd actually gotten more mail about the Okoe than any other issue during his administration <laughs> and he, so he knew the issue well and uh, but it was a pretty interesting trip, and I write about it in my book, uh, The Rafters and the River Trip that Saved the Okoe, because it was the pivotal event uh, that led to the solution. Uh, not so much what we did talked about on the river, but his commitment that he made uh, one night uh, or one day at lunch to call Senator Baker, who was uh, Senate Majority Leader at the Senator time. Senator Howard Baker who, as you said, Senate Majority Leader at that point, went on to be a cabinet officer in the Reagan administration um, and a uh, uh, very memorable uh, yeah, it politician. Was, yeah, it was kind of interesting because if you think about it, the stars just aligned for a very brief period. Had, had Baker not been Senate Majority Leader, and he was only Senate Majority Leader for two years, and at the right time, yeah. 
this would have never happened. And so he came up with a plan to provide a reimbursement to TVA for lost power. And uh, that, uh, and then, as you know, uh, we got a call from uh, the Commissioner of Conservation in October of 83 to come down to the TVA headquarters. Yeah, so we, at this point, we had gone for like seven or seven weeks or so with the river shut down, not knowing what the future, and our status with the, with the governor was, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> well, we knew something was going on, but, and you know, and in fact, I'd gotten a few calls here and there just asking this and that about it, so I knew they were working on it. But the call from Howell was the clear sign that we had a plan. And at that that, that would be Commissioner Charles Howell. Yeah, he was Commissioner, commissioner of the Department of Conservation. Department of Conservation. And so he was, he was kind of uh, Alexander's wingman on it. And uh, so we met in the Office of Power and uh, had a pretty interesting negotiation. You were there, David Bromell was there. Uh, we marked off the days for the river. It wasn't easy. There was some debate about how many days we were gonna get. They knew how much money was in the pot. So the issue was how many days we could get and what those days would be. So we came up with a schedule that's pretty much what it is today, although it's been adjusted a little bit. That was a contentious, several hour long discussion that yeah. day. There was 11 of them and four of us. Yeah. But it was a, you know, as uh, I had mentioned earlier, it was a direct negotiation, but we had, we were negotiating from a position of power with the state and Senator Baker's support. Uh, so TVA was there to make a deal, although, as you mentioned, there were some some pretty uh, significant uh, blow-ups. Well, yeah, and, and and some good things happened, but let me highlight a couple. You know, you, you mentioned we we were discussing the days of that the water would be released, and here we are on the last Friday before Labor Day, and, you know, we figured out that the water needed to flow on Mondays, Thursdays and Fridays uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And that's why the water's on today. <laughs> and uh, another big thing that you and I didn't quite see coming, I don't think, is that the, the state showed up, Commissioner House showed up and said, a, a bottom line requirement for the state of Tennessee is that the launch site and the takeout site become part of our state park system. The state of Tennessee is gonna look after the quality of recreation, we're going to keep an eye on TVA, and we're going to make sure this thing really happens according to the deal we're about to make. And so this nice parking lot, the launch ramp, uh, the ranger presence, which helps out with safety, the management, the permitting and, and oversight of outfitting, all that was uh, because of the com deep commitment the state made to ensuring this resource was going to be taken care of, which I think is... Uh, in retrospect was enormously important. Yeah, it was. And the agreement that was signed in 84 uh, gave the state easements to control the property for the put-in, the take-out, and the access points that were necessary to manage as a state park unit. The state actually didn't own any property here, but uh, TVA and the Forest Service had the property and they participated in the agreement, right. which was signed in March of 84 for 35-year term guaranteeing water releases for 116 days a year. And um, and so by 1983, uh, when the flume was complete, we were getting ready to move to the new schedule. The number of people using the river per year were, were, had gone up to... In the 90,000s, 90, last 000s. year, right. And so after 1984, when the new arrangement took place. Here we are 37 years later. And I remember the, the arrangement we made, I remember thinking in that TVA office as we made that deal, this is going to be a 35 year arrangement. And, and you know, for a person in his 20s, it's like that's forever. I know, and I, 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 I never I, did. I literally thought, you know, none of us are going to yeah. be around to paddle that river 35. Well, here you and I are 37 yeah. years later Four with kayaks on our car. and. Right. And, you know, all this still going on. So, uh, but there was a, it required another negotiation at the end of those 35 years, which about four years ago had heated up. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. The, when the contract was set to expire, TVA started, Outfitter started talking 
to, to them and uh, their original proposal was they had to come up with nine million dollars up front for five years of water releases. But where were outfitters going to get nine million dollars? Oh yeah. So obviously that was not workable. Very similar dynamics. I mean in some ways almost a, a copy of what ha happened. Yeah earlier. but virtually same thing except it was a little more abbreviated and yeah. uh, we, we, we had to organize again and uh, by, by that time, the uh, Outfitters had a state lobbyist who was able to work with the state right. to come up with the money to reimburse TVA. The interesting thing about the arrangement, the original arrangement, the $7.4 7 million, the Outfitters actually repaid the Treasury for the entire yeah. amount. And so that was done by 2018. And so they don't have, they'll, be, they'll also be uh, reimbursing the state uh, for the uh, uh, investment in water releases. Right. So, David, the uh, the outfitting industry um, and use of the river it peaked out at two hundred thousand people per year. I think it's over over two hundred forty, close to two hundred fifty thousand. So the growth was beyond what it, we were even guessing it might be. Yeah, it just exceeded expectations and in every way. And the number of outfitters, I think I recall, peaked at something like 22 outfitters at one point. It's declined through consolidation and just... It's about moving. that much now, actually. Oh, there are about yeah. 22 outfitters. And in the meanwhile, kayaking and canoeing has evolved. Uh, skill levels for whitewater kayakers have certainly gone up. And so the Okoe is really considered class three plus. You know, we've... We kind of call it class four back in the day, but it's regarded as more class three. And, and so uh, with plastic boats, with great designs, with safer designs, um, and with skill development, kayaking is, you know, the, the top end of kayak sport is running class five white water with 30, 40, 50 foot waterfalls and very rocky, I mean, things that make the Okoe look relatively tame. Uh, but the Okoe is still super popular and, and Class three and four kayaking is is probably the most still the most popular sector for private paddling as well. So this this river is covered up with kayakers on the weekends still, just like it was in the 80s and 90s, and uh, it's a great resource. Well, David, let's uh, let's kind of wrap it up here. I uh, your book, uh, folks, please buy it. There, there are some stories. David and I just stayed on the big picture topics and the dynamics of all this. The best part about this book are the, the anecdotal stories of life in Polk County, the, the bare knuckle fights with TVA. And the entertaining things that happened, the yeah. funny things. There were a lot of funny things that happened. Oh yeah, like uh, there's a raft guy named Smoke who <laughs> set up a booth at the Okoe River Festival, Smoke's Kissing Booth. Right. <laughs> None of us could imagine anybody wanting to kiss Smoke. Well, they paid more not to kiss him. <laughs> yeah. But there are lots of uh, stories like that uh, that occur in the book, so run out and buy one. David, thanks so much for uh, jumping in and doing this with us. Yeah. And again, folks, Southern Appalachian Paddle Sports Museum, SAPM. The website is paddlingmuseum.org. Uh, this interview, lots of other interviews with notable people in the history of whitewater in this part of the country. I uh, uh, hope you find this and those other ones entertaining. So David, let's... Well, thank you, let's, Mark. Let's go get in the river. All right, sounds good. Thank Bye. you.